yeah in the posterior approach also we can place the plate on the lateral surface of the fibula there Gen also we can generally is not required because the posteriorly when you go you want to put posteriorly much better but still as you said if you want to go laterally you can do it there is no arm for posterior approach yes is is there any fracture geometry that makes difference for putting the plate on posterior or lateral side if there is an oblique fracture which is going posteriorly then as a buttress plate posteriorly it will be a much better option okay. if the lateral plate if if there is an oblique plate is going laterally then probably a lateral plate will be better but if you do the leg screw then any one in which is going to be as good thank you and, and sir in bimedullar fractures where there is no posterior malleus in what uh, which cases we can go only for medial malleus fixation no i think if there is a bimalleolar you got to fix up the lateral malleolus always unless if it, it is really undisplaced you want to do a k wire or something but just to leave it alone just like that is not is, i feel is not safe because yes. if the posterior malleolus if the medial malleolus is displaced most likely the lateral malleolus will be also displaced so mostly we should always always we should go for the both 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 yeah yes anybody else wants to say anything or anything they want to suggest so if there uh, is acute tendoicalis rupture then how do you manage them if, if it is ruptured with some stump remaining or if it is ruptured directly from the insertion with no distal stump are you talking about the tendoicalis yes sir yeah if it is a tendon actually in a young man it always really ruptures through the tendon so that needs to be sutured up there are many many ways in which it is advised either you can do a closed one which is there in the youtubes or you can do a open one which is the safest thing and um, if it is in a elderly people with the hagland then with the spur then you have to excise the degenerated uh, tendon which is there from which it is ruptured in that situation i think you will have to excise the tendon which is uh, because if you just try to suture up from if it is well out from the posteriorly from the bone there is all, already a uh, um, some degeneration of the tendon so unless you excise the tendon it will never heal up so you excise the tendon you will have to elongate the tendon or do a tendon graft with the flexor hallucis longus or with the um, or with the peronia whichever way you think suitable So, in acute rupture, if the rupture is not through the substance, then you have to use suture anchor or drill through the calcaneum tunnel. Suture anchor is easier. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, can we start? Also, sir, sir, uh, regarding Cotton's test, uh, perioperatively, it is a very subjective test to check for the syndesmotic stability. If we are doing it with uh, some of uh, some great effort then we can actually but the surgeon who is operating always has a subjective uh, apprehension about pulling it too hard we haven't spoken about ankle fracture no? have i spoken about ankle fracture yeah it was discussed two weeks ankle fractures i have already finished ankle fracture yes sir oh i didn't i didn't remember that all uh, all approaches and x-rays ever oh oh So then today, today what are we going to talk? Yeah, that is why we were surprised to see the message also in the morning. Very sorry, I think I didn't realize it. No problem, sir. We can revise always. Always we learn. Always so cases we learn. today you will we will be discussing cases at different cases. No, no. We'll 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 finish something. Okay. Sorry, I I thought uh, in this batch we haven't spoken about the ankle. No, sir. It was a very fruitful two weeks back. Very fruitful discussion. Okay. okay. Then we'll talk and, about uh, something else. Chalo. In fact, after the discussion, I have uh, uh, done one or two cases in a very fat uh, diabetic with the rule of double, double fixation, double augmentation, double everything. Yeah. We'll talk about this. Uh, avoid. Avoid day one failure. Uh, available on the TV and done about three weeks back. Distal humerus, olecranon, terrible tear, distal femur, whatever we come to. 
We talk about the distal humerus. We haven't spoken distal humerus with your badge, no? Yes, yes. Last, uh, uh, last talk was by Dr. Gadegondi, sir, regarding the approaches around the elbow. So you can start after that, sir. It will be okay. Yeah, only the approaches were discussed. I wasn't there because I was in from a con. Anyway, we'll just talk this. Surgical anatomy. Basically, you have to consider these two as different columns, medial and lateral columns. And obviously, this is the articular surface. This is the, this is the distal humerus triangle. So when you, when you are operating upon, you have to basically fix up both the columns. After reconstructing the articular surface, you all know that very well, I'm sure. So now, we all know this, lateral column, medial column, and tie arch. The fractures are not so easily available like this. So the conventional is a 90 degree plate. One is posterior, one is medial. I wish all the fractures were like this, then it would have been much easier. But articular surface, the basic situation is articular surface is gone. My choice is electron on osteotomy. I feel it is, it is a safest way in which you can reconstruct the articular surface. Once you do the electron on osteotomy, see the whole electron on focile almost 360 degree by flexing the elbow, pressing the joint in congruity from posterior to right anterior side with reduction forces. For well, this perfect electron and osteotomy is not necessary because you have to see from front to back and when you flex it further, you'll be able to see even at the back. <coughs> you start off, insert first stabilizing K wire as a guide wire for cannulated screw as it is the best wire for the leg screw. <coughs> what is done is as a stabilizing wire, we always try to put the wire in the best position. Like this is the best position. But that is also the best position for the leg screw. So you first put the stabilizing wire as a, as a guide wire and put it into the position in which you want the best position. Now you can put the calculator and compress it. This is the best way which you can do it. Insert other wires around it so that you will be able to do it. Or if you want to first fix it up, put one wire here, one wire here. But this wire, which is the ideal position to put in a compression onto the trochlear groove, should be right into the position in which you want. Now, as you can see, you can fix it up, stabilize it, and then fix up with the compression screw so that now you have already reconstructed the joint. We won't talk about it. But this is the one which is obviously you'll have to avoid. So you'll have to go into the bone only and you've got to avoid this. At times, if you're not careful, you will be able to do the same thing. Now here, once you are there, you will have to really standard surgery still where things go wrong. As you can see, olecranon or osteotomy, which gives you the excellent access to the whole distal end of the humerus, then you can really fix it up all these this small screws as leg screws, and then the transfer free, and then you will be able to fix up the plate. Now, 99 degree conventional plate, this is the one which is there. The debate which goes on for the distal humerus fracture is 1990 or parallel plate. This is the one which has been talked about all the time. And individually, people talk about, no, no, parallel plate is better. Some people say 1990 is better. But all the double blind control studies have mentioned about it that the both the plates serve the same purpose if you do it properly. Now, all these are the ones which we talk about. So, plate first, if you apply the plate on one side, which is probably easier to apply after reconstructing the things, which we all know this very well. If you do the standard surgery, the fractures will do well. We get dragged into the controversy of 1990 or parallel plate and try a new surgery and spoil both standard surgery and the new parallel plate due to the lack of understanding. The parallel plate, here is the controversy, parallel plates versus 1990 plate. The parallel plate which has been described by in the Mayo Clinic, what they describe is every screw 
there is no leg screw onto the articular surface. As you can see, there are no leg screws in the articular surface. The screws from both the plate, they, they, they go down into the articular surface. So you will have to first, you will have to fix it up the articular surface. And here is the, the parallel plate which goes by. You, you may temporarily fix it up, but then the screws goes through that. This is the reason why the parallel plate is considered to be more stronger. But the, all the screws have to be occupied. And that's the reason why you'll have to first hold the reduction. This is, I'm talking about the parallel plate. First reduce and hold the reduction with this clamp. It is so easy to show on this diagram in this auditorium. But when you try to do it on the table, so many times this is so comminuted that you will not be able to hold it just like that. So that the parallel plate, every screw goes through that part. It's not always all the time simple like that. Do it in a live surgery on comminuted fragments and then we realize it is easy only in this fracture if we are lucky to treat such a simple fracture. My comment, if the parallel plate was not written by Mayo Clinic, it would not have got such publicity. If any one of us had written in Nasik, it would not have been spoken about it even anywhere nearby. For an average surgeon, stick to the one you are most comfortable. Every surgeon wants to do something new. If they have the volume to be that for them, for me, whatever I can do the best, I think I should do the best. Because I think if you are doing once in two months, one, one digital humerus fracture, just stick to whatever you are used to. What does the literature say about these two constructs, parallel plate and the 1990 plate? This article tested two different plate designs in five different configurations. Conclusion for the stable fixation, the plate should be placed on the separate columns, but not necessarily 90 degrees to each other. Tested five constructs, strongest construct, medial reconstruction plate with posterior lateral dynamic compression plate. This is supposed to be the most constructed. What is the evidence? Jesse Jupiter, you know, 1990 versus plating with the digital numerus. Although some biomechanical evidence may favor a parallel plate, real message is both orientations are strong enough to mobilize after fracture fixation. From clinical perspective, no sufficient data for valid comparison. Different patient types and a fracture type were compared. And hence, ultimate solution, the ultimate effect is whatever you are most comfortable with, do the plate. Do not go and drag on to that the parallel plate is better than the other plate. Now, if this is the major problem is inadequate fixation. Now, this was only one column was fractured, but you can see inadequate fixation of the column is the main reason for the failure of most fractures. This could have been easily done by this tension band and the whole thing was ultimately corrected by this. So do not just enter into this small, mini, mini invasive surgeries and try to just save the plant. Every one column has messed up. Could you salvage by simple K-wire and a tension band like Kastan? There was no second column which was involved here, so that was perfectly good for you. Or here, there's a minor surgeon. He only did one column and second column, he tried to do it with this screws, which is not enough. You got to fix up both the columns. Unless you fix up both the columns, you will be really sorry at the end of it because it will not be stable. This screw is like a one screw or two screws is not going to be good enough. Now here, digital fragment is too small, so option KYS and the tension band. Now it is depending upon, but today's plates now, which are locking plates, which are there, you will be able to fix up the distal fragment, which is like this, without any, any problem whatsoever. This is another surgery which has been recommended and which has been done. I'm quite fond of this. You can do if the fragment is too small. And even if you feel the locking plate, the sufficient only not there on the distal fragment. Like in this fracture at that time. This is how it was treated. Three screws and these two K wires, and from this K wire on the same side, put this tension band wire. This doesn't work on the tension band principle. This is only immobilizing it, but this gives you a very good fixation. This is an option. This is not the primary treatment, but this is an option. But this is the cheapest way in which you can treat it. And you can see having treated this perfect range of movement and everything, cheapest option, both columns are fixed 
and you can get a good range of movement also. Now the fracture like this, which is a small column which is there. This is a very small column. So again, the same sort of a surgery can be done for this sort of a very small column where you feel that the locking screws two or three will not go into the digital fragment. Or even if they go, and at the end you find it's not very comfortable, then you can add up one or two wires in order to really supplement it. If the bolts are too porotic, locking plate also does not hold. So this is the one which has been described. This is the diagrammatic thing. You have fixed up the lower end of the humerus. Then this K wire goes here, K wire goes there to come out a little. Because on this, you are going to really hitch on to the, the tension wire. So they have to be just out, not too much out where it can hurt. So just out so that it is going to hold the fracture. It is going to hold the wire. Okay. two K cross wire future wire. Now, this is the one which could be treated with the plate also. Because the fragments are fairly big enough here. But this is the one that at that time it was treated and it gives you a good fixation. Now in a fracture like this, this is Dr. Negi's case, this is a fracture like this. You can see the CT scans is done. It's a very small fragment. So I think yes, first and the foremost is the olecranon osteotomy. One can never see this much without a good olecranon osteotomy. The first is the olecranon osteotomy. Once you've done the olecranon osteotomy, now you can see the whole lower end of the humerus. You can see it very, very well. So then fix up the lower end of the humerus. These are the few screws which he has put in. You can see it's fully reconstructed. And, and, and here are the two plates, three plates he had to put in. Probably he will present this case if he is around. This is the one in which you can do that. So this gives you a very good idea. Without only chronic osteotomy, such a cumulative fracture, you cannot fix it up. And this plate, only thing it has to be that this plate has to be, it has to be unequal length. It is the one thing which we try to preserve it all the time. Proclea is separate from the medial epicondyle and third plate added to fix it up. As you can see it over here. This is the one which was ultimately there. Olecranon fixation was done, the plating was done. This is nine months. As you can see, such a combinated factor, so beautifully it has been fixed up, and this is the range of movement. So, with such a combinated factor, also, there is no, it is not no, no real necessity to panic. You will, if you can fix up all the fragments, and then even if this was a third plate which was fixed up, you can still get an excellent result. Only thing is that articular surface has to be fixed up properly. Once you have fixed up the articular surface and two columns, you have fixed up properly, and then you are very likely to get a good fixation. Now, the, I will talk about, a little about the olecranon osteotomy. There are two, three types of olecranon osteotomies which have been described. This is the intra-articular and extra-articular, and this is the trap approach. Trap approach, people feel that if the articular surface doesn't need to be done, then you do not need an olecranon osteotomy. The hesitation about the olecranon osteotomy is people do not fix up the olecranon osteotomy at the end of the surgery properly. So there is a small incidence of non-union. Now here you can see this is intra-articular osteotomy. While this is extra-articular osteotomy. To me, this osteotomy is not really required. If you can do it with this, you can do it also with the trap. I always do this intra-articular osteotomy. Because that is the way in this intra-articular fracture, you can see it perfectly well. I have no hesitation in doing the osteotomy ever if it is needed in an intra-articular fracture. This is only, some people still do this, while some of the people who have read this trap approach, even intra-articular fracture also, they try to do with the trap approach and they claim that they can see the articular surface also perfectly well. For intra-articular fracture humerus reduction, intra-articular osteotomy at the olecranon notch, osteotomy gives excellent visibility of the anterior most part of the joint. Let those who want to experiment do it. But to stick to one osteotomy, unless you have a very high volume, then you can experiment what you want to volume. Now, the type of an osteotomy. This is the one which is ideal one 
Chevron osteotomies prefer to give a better and a more stable bony contact during the repair. The larger surface improves the bone healing and the shape improves the rotational stability. TAP versus Olecodon osteotomy, September 2018. Osteotomy better results in community factor. 40% are three, three, four parts severely community factors. Tap better in two parts simple factors. But our assessment of fracture being simple, two part, may be wrong at times. Here is the case. Again, I think this is Dr. Negi's case. 60 year old may look like a simple two part fracture, as you can see very well. This appears like a simple two part fracture. You don't need to do anything except just fix up this part and this is the problem. You fix it up. But see what happens. Traction film shows the fracture is at three part. Here is the fracture intraarticular. This is a fracture and this is a fracture. So you can see how the fracture, which appears to be very benign fracture, you just gave a traction and it made traction. CT is, not, is a different thing. CT will give you still better in, information. But you can see it is like this. So now, without the olecranon osteotomy, see how much of the combination is there. Without the olecranon osteotomy, you will not be able to treat this in the best possible way. So this is the olecranon osteotomy and all the fragments are corrected, temporarily fixed with the wires, as you can see. And once they fix fixed with the wires and the leg screw, now you fix up one column and fix up the second column. It is a, as, as simple as that. But then you are, you, are, you are really reducing the fracture with this clamp pair, the clamp pair, and these are the three clamps which are reducing the fracture. And these are the K-wires which are temporarily fixing up the fracture. And then you can see at the end of the surgery, everything is fine and you got almost the full range of movement. So surgery of olecranon osteotomy, the incision is never on the olecranon, it is always this sort of uh, incision. Uh, yeah. I'll learn now to be found out then, this chevron type here or this is alternative, whatever you feel is perfectly all right, there is no problem over this. Sometimes the fracture configuration is such the reverse chevron osteotomy is preferred. Now the my main key is you got to go to this part of the bone where you will be able to see posteriorly anteriorly. Do not do the osteotomy so uh, so higher up. Do the osteotomy right into the middle. This is the non-articular surface of the part. So and cut with the saw and what was recommended is cut with the saw and the remaining part cut with the osteotome which I feel will splinter the bone. So I, I don't do this. Because of the shape of the olecranon, use the fine oscillating saw to divide only up to the three quarters of the depth of the bone. Now, chisel, use a chisel on the last part of the bone, but only just short of a subquadral bone. Remember that the central ridge of the olecranon, which is very strong, will need to be divided deeper using a very narrow blade chisel. Now, this, this is what it is. But what was in conventional is you cut three fourths and then break it. You break it, it is going to break it, not really where it is going to be useful. And then break the bone by manipulation. This maintains the irregular surface of better resuturing. That is what is believed and that is what is being taught. And see what has happened. You go here and you break. Now, the, this is the piece which has now come out. So, this is osteotomy. This is the piece which has come out. So you haven't got the full view of the articular surface. If manipulation used to open this last part, it can go like this. Most of the time when you break it down, it is a, this is the way it's going to go. So my, my thing is, go down in the joint, you protect the joint with one of the, any of the metal and go down all the way down. You can go down with the osteotome or the, or the oscillating. So go down all the way down so that you will have the osteotomy which is like this and it is not like this. So till now reconstruct the joint. So you put something here and now cut it fully. The and olecranon osteotomy should be lower and visibility of the articular surface be proper. Unless it is lower down, then you will not be able to see the whole articular surface. If you do it somewhere here, then it will not be fully visibility there. So I do as low as possible, put something in between the joint after this traction and cut it fully so that you have a clean cut there and it doesn't splinter out. 
my choice cut with the oscillating lifting so all the way protecting the articular surface and now fix it up fixing it up is with the two k wires and here is the tension here is the tension wire which is going and then you fix it up the pair of the osteotron now this has been done it on the k wire so i'll come to that tw surgical tips two smooth k wire inserted from the proximal olecranon on transverse the fracture line and engage the anterior alveolar cortex better resistance to the wire migration if you do it like this then the wire has a good chance of migrating while if you do it like this entering anteriorly that is the one which is recommended we all know this very well now we know this very well that it has to go anteriorly but not posterior it has to go anteriorly now when it goes anteriorly you have to be also careful that approximately 40 mm of distal to the fracture line and 5 mm from the posterior cortex 2 mm transverse hole on the dorsal surface 40 mm from the fracture 5 mm from the posterior to here make a hole minimum distance of the fracture should not be less than 20 mm distal to the fracture line don't put a wire here take it a slightly longer position now once you put the wire reduction and fixation of the olecranon using 2.5 mm drill make a coronal hole in the proximal ulna from ulna to radial side to pass the figure of 8 wire because you here is the radius so you know what to pass from radius to ulna ulna to radius this is the ideal situation now push in the wire push in the wire prepare 8 mm wire by making a loop approximately if you want to do double loop if you are doing a single loop then there is no need to do this loop at all making a loop approximately one third along its length insert the shorter segment of the wire through this drill hole and the lower upper fragment you go higher up now surgical tips direction of the k wire identify the posteromedial ridge of the olecranon 30 degree ulnar angulation avoid impingement of the wire on the radius now if you go there in the radius if you go in the radius here then you will hit the radius so this wire should be coming out of the ulna on the ulnar side anterior not on the radial side this is the one i show you into the other one now if you go like this then there is a possibility that the head of the radi the shaft of the radius will be hurt by that wire and it will be obstructing it so that's the reason you come out on the ulnar side anterior now you can see here this, this is the one where the surgeon has come out on the radial side you can see this radial side this is where he has come out and it is hitting this is the one i was operating when i saw this this is the one it is hitting so it would make a click sound when you try to do supination pronation in this maltreated case so do not let this wire hit the other side it hit the radial side this is the wire which is hitting the radius as you can see here this is where the wire came this is where the wire came which i which when i was trying to see the moment it was hitting the radius you can see it in the ct scan but it's not as explanatory otherwise so now then it was changed and it was put on the other side this this was reconstructed and it was put on the other side so this is the way in which you should do it So the K wire penetration, full penetration, supination should be checked after the wires are inserted. Anterior metaphysis is triangular. Lateral X-ray can be misleading. Penetration has to be underestimated. So after engaging the second cortex, the wires are slightly backed out and the bend 180 degrees over the tension band here. So you go down, then pull it out a little. and then you put in the tension band and here you you need the band that is a normal thing now now it is what is recommended is make a small cut into the triceps put this wire bend wire put it on the triceps underneath the triceps inside and put in the tension band between the triceps and the bone under this wire so this wire so you make a cut in the triceps it will go down and it will remain there 
this is the way it has been recommended. This is the one which goes behind the bone, behind the patella. This is patella, same thing is for the olecranon. It goes behind the muscle, it goes behind the muscle. These wires are not the ones on which the wire is engaging. So here it is what has been done, make a two cuts on the triceps. Now pass two wires. Once having passed through wires, now make this cut and push them inside. Tension man and the tricep, two cuts in the tricep, push the wires on the bone after introduction. Having put it now, you put in the tension band wire onto this. Double loop or a single loop, double loop is slightly better than the single loop. If you've been practicing this properly, then this wire has to be only jutting out a little here. Then, you will not have a non-union and these wires will not come out. But if you keep these wires outside the triceps, they have a tendency to come out. This wire, even if it is intramedullary, even if it is intramedullary, are most and most unlikely to come out because the triceps is there all the time. So using the two knots here produces symmetrical tension at the fracture site and gives more rigid fixation than using a single knot. But in practice, I have found no hardly any difference between this single knot and the double knot. I use only the single knot. I have tried double knot, but I find that it's not going to be as useful as the single knot. Because I use this Harris wire tightener. This is an excellent instrument of wire tightener. There's the reason this, it can be done only if you are putting a single knot. So I don't put a double knot. You can do it here and put in a wire tightener and this really tightens the whole thing beautifully. I find tensioning with this plier leaves at times a loop which is not straightened if we do it with only with the plier. So one knot gives a better tension with the Harris wire tightener. That is how I use this. I do not choose this screw because this screw, when you go down, it has to engage it perfectly. As you can see, if it, is, if it doesn't engage here, then it will remain out. If it, if it doesn't engage at all, it is of no use. Or if it is, goes on the side, and if it is not, if it is engaging here, it will it will open out. So I don't use the screw at all. I use only the tension band, in, uh, uh, only the K wires in order to use the tension band. The screw is a hit and a miss situation. Screw is perfectly well fitting digitally, then you will get a good compression. But if it is not perfectly well fitting, then when you do the compression, this is going to distract out. It, because this, this will not be able to go further. And that's the reason the screw, I do not like the screw alone or screw with the tension band. This is the one I use it always with the K wire and the tension band. Compression depends on the screw fit in the proximal ulna. If it is too tight, distraction, too loose, no compression. When tension band is put, since the screw is not going forward, screw is not going forward and you put the tension band, there will be a some amount of opening it out. So these are the ones which is the ideal situation. You put in the tension band and not with the screw at, according to me. Check intraoperative fluoroscopy must evaluate the final reduction position of the K-wire. Stability of the fixation improvement of the hardware must be evaluated by taking the elbow to the full range of movement and the osteotomy should not open out when you're doing the flexion extension after fixing it up. Elbow movement should be smooth without scraping, grating or clicking. In pronation, the biceps supine muscles are in contact with the anterior metaphysis of the ulna. And protrusion of two to three millimeter may cause a significant impingement, as you can see it over here. Neurovascular damage restricted forearm rotation, so inside heterotopic ossification or a radio ulnar stenosis. So wires should come out anteriorly, but on the not on the side of the radius, but on the side of the other side. Now here you can see all these are the ways in which you can do the osteotomy. But you stick to the one standard osteotomy which you're doing it and then you will not regret it. This is a standard osteotomy, this is a standard fixation and then you will not have a regret at all. I'm not very fond of this k wire that this screws as I mentioned to you earlier. These screws bite the canal and the alveolus. Delayed union. If this is the reason mainly a delayed union because you have not been able to fix it up properly. And this has not gone, so if the wire comes out, it will be a delayed union. Symptomatic hardware prominence. Now, several osteotomy, 
David Ring and all digitally directed several osteotomy gives excellent access to most complicated distal intraarticular fractures of the human. Larger surface area, better bone to healing, and Chevron improves the rotational stability. Trap relies on the tendon to bone healing, which is inferior to the bone to bone healing. Now, these are the situations where surgeon did this two, two column fixation, only one screw is there, and they are ending up at the same time, too short a plate. This is where the fracture is ending. Place too short, both condyles are unstable. That's the reason why if you put the plate, it has to be long enough here, it has to be long enough the other one, unequal plate. This is what you should do it. Place removed and the remove the surgeon was not equipped to refix. This is what happened. You can see this was the range of movement which was there. This was a deformity. So this was the CT scan. This was the CT scan. Now, patient, the anesthetist couldn't control the patient. Patient went into hypertension and uh, I had to close down the patient only with this K wires. Still, I felt it was a decent fixation because these fragments were small, so I did only this k wire. k wire should have gone slightly higher up. It's also slightly higher up, but there was hardly any chance of correction because the anesthetist was at, at my back, which was wrong, I think. Fragments too small and porotic plate, so I, instead of a plate, I did this k wire, and I started mobilizing. Once I started mobilizing, started mobilizing, everything fell apart. So now stabilize the patient and in the bit the better anesthetic. When I stiff elbow when tried mobilizing, she made construction unstable. So now I went down, did the double plating, and after double plating, I tried to get the movement. There was no movement available at all. This plate should not have ended at one end. This is the one I agree. It should have gone one, should have gone higher. But the crux of the matter is. After fixation and bone grafting, I tried to see the elbow movement and it was elbow was stiff. If you reconstruct the elbow and elbow is stiff, this is what probably must have happened in the K wire, which I did. So I mobilized the elbow. I mobilized the elbows to the extent the elbow was possible to, to bend it from zero to 90 and slightly more. Mobilized the stiff elbow and fix the plate and the screw. And then, fortunately for me, after four surgeries and four years, this is what is the position six months. Now patient has a good range of movement. And then everything. The crux of the surgery was, unless if when you fix up the supracordular fracture, it doesn't work out. Knee has to be mobile. Same thing, elbow has to be mobile, and then only you will be able to really get the range of movement and all. Are you seeing my slides or no? Yes, sir, we are able to see. Because I am I am getting the message, the internet is unstable. The stiff elbow needs surgical mobilization after fixation to relieve the strain on the new construct. Now you can see this, this was the one lateral plate was not long enough and was too bulky for this lateral condyle. And so ordinary recon plate was good enough. This was the recon plate was used. And on the lateral side, it was supplemented with this K wire. So this was a sort of a fracture supplemented with the thick K wire, and this worked. This worked, and the fracture healed up ultimately. And he had an excellent range of movement. So you can, and if in case you have a problem, this is what I was talking about. You have a problem. You put in the wire, and still you feel this is badly communicated. One K wire or a two K wire supplementary also will be useful to add uh, to increase the bone fixation. Now here it is on day one. You can see how the the fracture is. This is on day one. This is normal. But you see, day one this is normal. You can see here on four months it is increased a lot. If this was done a CT scan, you would have been able 
able to detect the strict fracture of the capitulum which is there. This is the reason why the four months CT on day one would not miss this. CT is not utilized enough for a full assessment solution by a CT one like this. So any doubtful fracture, CT is a very good use and you will not miss out this fracture. This fracture was felt as if it is the undisplaced fracture, but this you can see it is a split CT. It is a split uh, capitulum. Ultimately, she was in trouble. She was in trouble. She had only this much range of movement. And obviously, you can see the CT scan now. Now you can see, appreciate the CT. Are you seeing the CT scan of this? Are yes, sir. There? Sorry? Yes, Are sir. You? We are able to see that. And the lady on the you right side. You see the CT scan and the... And the, and the oh, that's right. Yes, yes, so you yes, can sir. see this CT, if it was done earlier, it could have been repaired very well. Now, all these are the CTs. I think Dr. Negi has a beautiful collection of this split, split of the um, elbow joint like this, and then he'll be able to talk about that properly. But this is the one which you have to do it. Excision of this fragment, if it is not repairable and if it is old, you can do only if it is only the capitulum piece, it can be excised. But if it is a fresh one, it has always, always you have to suture it back. There is no question of excision. But occasionally you face the situation which is old one and you cannot really fix it up this. Then like a head of the radius which we could excise, the capitulum also can be excised if it is not repairable as a last resort, not as a primary treatment. Excision of this piece was only option. It's not preferred treatment. It's a salvage here. It will be okay as if it is only capitulum without any portion of the olecranon fossa. If the olecranon fossa was cut, then obviously you cannot really stitch it up. And then you cannot excise it. So that's the reason why at that time, it was not very easy for me to do the fix. Most of the time, such split fractures are not treated adequately. And I think this is a separate subject. So I'll, I'll request Dr. Negi to speak about this split fracture. Or like what I to me to say, the intra-articular piece is very helpful and the piece can be well fixed with the Herbert screws. As you can see, it has, all these things can be done here. Now all approaches and everything, now everything has changed. You can do the medial approach, the lateral approach, depending upon where is the split, uh, split like this, you can do only the lateral approach and you will be able to fix it up with these Herbert screws which were there, which in those days also we, we could do it perfectly well. So I'll, I'll, I'll not talk about the split fractures because I think he has a very, he has a very good collection of these split fractures. You can see these fractures. This was the straight fractures. Ultimately, what I got on osteotomy, I could see all the fractures. All the fractures were reduced. And ultimately, the temporary K wire and fixed up with these screws. As you can see it over here, only with the screws and tension band picked up. And it immediately gave you a good result because the new anatomy was reconstructed. Data is to avoid complications, faded K wire, pin cable system instead of. No difference in mechanical strength. Tension W with K wire having the eyelet, simple figure of eight without a use of a K wire. Anything what you can do, whatever is going to be a good situation for you. But do not miss out on a split fracture of the lower end of the human. Any idea what is this? Anybody can say? Fracture capitulum. Capitulum. So, what will you do for this? Tension band wiring can be done. Now, you just see independently. This is the lower end of the humerus. Medial side, lateral side. Do you find any problem here? There is a fracture head of the radius. You can see it here. So when I yes, went, head of the radius. This was the pakka head of the radius and there was nothing to do with the capitulum. 
head of the radius exact it was a very stable elbow at that time we didn't have the head of the radius replacement so it was a stable elbow coming at the head of the radius the piece was excised and now you can see so it was an illusion if you it was an illusion as if it's the capital of time Now you can see this, this, this forearm fracture with this sort of a capitulum fracture. The surgeon fixed up with two screws. And it went apart. You can see two and a half months it went apart. This fracture is held up, so we don't talk about it. This is a CT scan of that. Which it shows it is a fragmented piece, there is nothing which is there. So the second surgeon, I don't know what situation he made, he made this plate with this small wing and has not done anything to the capital of which is separated out. This is how the second surgeon treated. This is the stage I got the patient. This is how it was. So I went ahead and all these fractures, like a Hoffa's fracture, which I think we spoke about, a buttress plate here. These were the two buttress plates were required with this sort of a screw, leg screw going by. The olecranon osteotomy was done, as you can see. And then ultimately, the whole thing is held up when the patient has got a full range of movement and the fracture is up. So I think. Any minimal try to mini do the minimal surgery is not going to be good enough. So the slice fracture, like a OFA fracture, if it is possible to buttress it, buttressing it is going to be a good idea. This is the one, ultimately it held up with these two plates and the legs screw. And all like on osteotomy helped to do the things. You can see this fracture is held up. And he had a good range of movement, ultimately. Now, this is the one which is the distal end of the humerus. This is the plate which is a metaphysical plate. This has to be put it properly. Otherwise, it will be prominent like this. You can see this is the problem. This plate should have come way down inside. So this should have come, everything should have shifted way down inside. This plate should have been shifted and angulated slightly differently so that this will go inside. It should have gone inside. There is, that is how is the page should have ended up normally. So then it will not be prominent the way it is going to be. So seeing it as prominent. Now here it is a ordinary plate. Even if the fracture heals up, still it's a problem. This was the ordinary plate. And then ordinary plate also gave this sort of a problem. So this plate also should have been seen on the table that it doesn't give you a trouble. All this is the one which is jutting out and that's why it's giving you the trouble. Now here was the case which I operated upon. You can see here, first plate, second plate, and this is how all three cases plate had to be removed and fortunately the radial now could be saved. This is also the same problem was there of this plate. So this metaphysical plate has to be adjusted properly so that it doesn't involve the electron fossa and also it is not going to be out like this where it's going to be a problem. So it has to be adjusted like this, then probably you will not have an issue. Here, oh, this was a typical supraguanular factor, put two plates. And while putting the plate, that one plate was outside, which I could not take it out. And so I took it out and it was an Indian plate. Ultimately, I faltered and it I again broke it again here. So I changed the plate, long plate, second plate, and this metal condyle edited with this tension band and ultimately salvage the position. The surgery which should have been over in a, one and a half of a time took four hours because all these things was an issue there. So you got to see the lateral plate became too proud and was prominent. So open the wound while removing the Indian locking plate broke the humerus scap. So did the fixation of that fracture with plate and tension band and condyle. So this is, I feel that lower end of the humerus is the treatment which you should do it properly and then you will not miss it out. Do not go into the into the conflict of medial and lateral plates. This is the one which gives you a very good fixation. And once you can fix up both the columns, 
then your problem is almost solved. Any questions? Are you said in stiff? Are you said in stiff valve? We should do first manipulation, then plate fixation. They should know what better. Stiff valve from earlier surgery. Sorry. If the patient elbow is stiff from somebody's else operated, and we want to revise the elbow. It's a very, 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 very brutal to the elbow. I don't ever manipulate the elbow joint. Elbow joint, it has to be released because the sheet is stiffness because of the adhesions intra-articular. So it should be, if at all, it should be released and not manipulated. You may do the manipulation after really removing the teeth, but not initially. Okay. okay. Sangeet, I can see them. Any comments on this and any suggestions? Any one of you? So I think the manipulation is almost given up now. Yeah. yeah. Unless, unless say it is a post-operative patient oh. where the patient is not mobilizing at all, 10 to 15 days, just slight sedation and encouraging them to mo mobilize by self is what is encouraged, but no manipulation. Well, manipulation, you don't know what you're going to cut. You intend to cut the adhesions, but it doesn't. Adhesions at times are so strong that you will fracture the bones rather than the uh, adhesions. Yes. Uh, probably it works best in a shoulder, not in a elbow. You will have a pathological fracture on the table if you manipulate the elbow. Yeah, shoulder manipulation. manipulation I mean, sir, slight relaxation in anesthesia, just to encourage, uh, as uh, Dr. Chandrik said. Sometimes patient doesn't move because maybe pain something after two weeks. Sanjay, do you want to add up something? No, nothing, sir. Nothing. Dr. Negi, are you here? You also have those slides right there, no? The presentation. Sanjay? Yes, sir. Sir, I'm driving home. I take 10 you minutes. Have the slides. Leave. Slice of the, yes. of the... Yes, sir. I'm driving home. Okay. I will take 10 minutes to eat. Okay, Sangeet. Okay. Okay. No problem. Yeah. 10 minutes, we'll discuss something. Be, yes. be comfortable. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, Chandra. Carry on, please. Yeah. So, any, any questions, Rakesh? That was an interesting question. Uh, whether well, I mean to say, sir, yeah. can we do... Slight manipulation, I mean, to under an anesthesia, you rightly said. Can it is advisable? Sometimes patients advisable. don't move. No, but thing is, uh, that was carried out in past when the suture, uh, suturing techniques were not very advanced, where the wound healing protocols were not very nicely judged, where the soft tissue uh, were not optimized prior to surgery. It was an error, but now that has been given up totally. The, the risk is, one, you are manipulating and causing some more injuries. Second risk is you are manipulating in a tissue which is rapidly healing and then you cause more uh, hematoma and more stiffness. And third biggest risk is in a very osteopathic, what happens after any fracture or after energy? There is intense uh, vascularity increase and that leads to osteopenia. And in this phase, if you are manipulating, there is a uh, tremendous risk of developing a pathological fracture as we have seen in our clinical practice again and again that patient come with a problem their elbow is fixed even after olecranon and, and they get a manipulation and they develop some other fracture so those are the risks Jeez. thank you sir. after you open it up you release the things and then under vision then you do a little manipulation to cut the abyss to really break the vision. That is perfectly all right. But that yes. is already cut like a patella is cut. You release the patella. And you have done the quadriceps plasty. So you have done the quadriceps plasty. You already mobilized the knee joint uh, comparatively more than what it was stiff with. Last few degrees, you may do the manipulation to stretch out the muscle. Or the same yes. thing when you open up the shoulder. 
Yeah. But a closed manipulation, I don't think I have done it for now. Many, 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 many years. Yes. And as sir said, the role of manipulation, not actually manipulation, it is it is just tensioning the joint so that you know what structure is obstructing further range of motion. And that can be released either uh, by your scalpel or by your periosteum elevator. The crux is careful mobilization of the joint by efficient soft tissue releases. Yes. Whether you open, it is your choice. Yes. Yes, yes. Gadi Goni said you wanted to say something. No, there is Negi. Negi is joining or not? Are you there? He is yet to join. Yeah, you don't see. May I show one case of elbow? Sir, one question. question. Sir. Yeah, question first. By that time, Dr. Gadi Goni said you can load up your case. Sir, if uh, most of the times or sometimes we find that distal humerus uh, where we put the articular screws, uh, uh, articular reduction screws is not, uh, uh, do not have that big chunk. So what you prefer, sir? Uh, is it multiple K-wire fixation that has to be removed afterwards or uh, we put the articular screw, uh, reduction screw through the plate? I got your point. Uh, see, there are different situations in uh, distal humerus. One is a very TY type of fracture where you have a very stable construct. You fix it with whatever non-lock construct, lock construct that is stable. What you are portraying is a condition where the articular communication is there and you do not have enough screw hole there. In such yes, a situation, sir. Yes, sir. in such a situation, you have to create two stable columns. Once you create two stable columns, then whatever screw takes the biggest hole. So one going from the most medial side to uh, lateral towards the trochlea and from lateral side, especially with a flange. And that is how you create stability. In addition, you can use uh, log, uh, missed KY techniques or uh, multiple lost KY techniques or multidirectional KYs, which are very efficiently bent and uh, subcutaneously placed, not percutaneously. Is That is fine, no problem. Is there any specific choice to put from medial to lateral or lateral to medial or so interval screw? So as is available in the lock construct. So there are two or three philosophies. So without lock locking construct, sir, if we want to put intercondylar screw. So intercondylar screw best is put from lateral to medial because from medial to lateral, there is always the nerve which is coming in while driving, there will be a problem. So I prefer from lateral to medial. That is easier because in the lateral film, you take a gola of the capitulum or the roundishness of capitulum in the lateral film. And that is exact center where you can put the screw. So that is much better. And usually we used to put the screw in the non-lock construct before. The principle there was getting the articular block first. And there we used to uh, <laughs> get the articular screw. Nowadays, whether partially, yes. whether partially threaded or fully threaded, what are the latest guidelines? So if you use partially threaded, don't over compress the pulley. That is the crux. If you over compress the pulley, your range of motion 20 degrees in both the side is lost. And that is one of the important reasons of loss of uh, major loss of movement. So don't over compress the pulley. It should just be opposed. So this articular reduction has a pulley. So realize two different instinct uh, situations. The intra-articular position of, say, intercondylar femur is a bit different. There, the pulley is usually not very shortened because large mass of bone is there. But in yeah. the trochlea and distal humeral, you must never over-compress the pulley. We just adequately reduce it. That is the principle. And the primary thing is it has to be a cannulated screw. So that once you put in the guide wire, you know that the position of the guide wire is perfect. Because at times the guide wire, when you starting point is somewhere and the ending point may be far more posteriorly or far more anterior. Yes. So go into the center of it. So you first put the guide wire, see that the guide wire, once it has come out on the opposite side, it's not hitting the under now. And then once the position is all right, now you can go ahead and put in a drill and a cut and a cannulated screw. 
And so just starting with the calculated screws to start with is not an ideal situation. You put another K wire or you uh, yeah, the same same guide wire. wire and another you neutralize with the K wire above and below. Thank you. Or at least at least one more K wire to really neutralize. And you got to put it in a compression mode, so it has to be partially threaded screw. One more with washer, or without, with washer or without washer? Sorry. With washer? With the washer, if the bone is porotic, yes, with the washer. There is no harm. But then the washer, it should be only on the lateral side. Because on the medial side, the ulnar nerve is too nearby and then the screw will jut out if you put the washer. So it has to be onto the lateral side. Yes, sir. Sir, one more thing. Yeah. You don't need the washer. One, one more question, Chandak, sir. Uh, yes, yes. What is the role of uh, excision of a very thin slice of capitulum in the literature? How much uh, instability so, by or how should we, what, what should uh, be the deciding factors for oper operatively? So by and large, in a communicated TY type of uh, supracondylar, you are taking a posterior approach. And by this approach, usually we are not excising capitulum. We try to get it into position, take two or three dura elevators, get the uh, condyle well, uh, the capitulum well aligned, and then you can use multi um, one point uh, point eight mm or one mm K wire, get it right back into position. The excision of capitulum usually is a secondary exercise. That is what my uh, belief, philosophy, and practice is. Let us take opinion from Tanna sir also. What he feels. Presentation I mentioned about if it is a whole community and only capitulum which is not. Then only in the last resort, I think it can be yes. never exercised as a primary thing. Yes. How much ever it is a thin slice of bone, we should fix it primarily. Fixable. If it is fixable. And that should be fixed with the Herbert screw extra apart from the plate or with the plates? Sorry. Because we are applying plate on the posterior lateral surface of the yeah. humerus. We so, should fix the capitulum with yeah. the screw. Yeah. From okay. through the plate or without plate? I'll, I'll answer that question with a PPT slide. Let uh, Dr. Gadigone uh, present this case. After that, uh, I would uh, present something about supracondylar. The plate position and the small screw and small fragments. Gadigone sir, you are ready? Chandak sir, there is a problem. I will open it and I will do it until I will do it. I will present by that time. Sir, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, what you prefer, man, of putting screws? Man, sir, we want something uh, intraoperatively, how to assess the position of screw or how to assess the correct reduction. Okay. So, if, let me if, present if some. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Hmm. After okay. that, you can. Yes, sir. So, so he, here we'll obtain expert opinions from Tanna, sir, also. So, I think up to this point, there is no confusion, right? The approach is uh, the electron approach. Usually, we get such a picture where a lot of communication is there. Now, how to assemble them step by step? This is what is our ultimate goal. So, one plate, the, this plate is easier. The lateral one is easier. So, to put this plate is easier. Now, here, look at the communication. I, I hope you are able to see this screen. Yes, sir. We, we are able to see. Okay. So, now, this is usually the position. So this chunk usually is good. The chunk of the trochlea and communication is here at the junction where the ridge of capitulum is there. And this part is usually communicated. This is what the usual picture is. So some communication here in the non-articular part is absolutely no issue. That is fine. But the communication here in the capitulum, we organize as best as possible. We have a array of three screws here which would be able to take most of the purchase. If not, we then pass from the lateral column two, three, or four K wires. As Tanna sir suggested, we also pass a K wire from along the intercondylar axis. We may put in addition, in spite of a locking plate use, a K wire first. Let the locking plate screws take their own position and then pass uh, the screw. Or reverse way can be we can use the intercondylar screw first and then pass the 
plate. This small combination you forget about. And the medial plate is usually the most medial on the medial column. However, in previous era, we used to apply a posterior medial plate as well. But that requires a lot of molding. The locking plate gives goose control. Now, these two constructs on both the sides. Now, the crux of the medial plate is that this bending should take the last screw and that screw should be well contained into the uh, medial uh, column and the intercondylar area. And these three screws give you enough purchase. The flange screw would take the flange screw would take maximum bite. So take care that this flange screw goes as maximum as possible. And when these two columns are constructed, that gives enough purchase. Now the problem is when there is a lot of combination in this area, how to manage? I would use multiple KYs as required. So basic stability is by column. One screw from the medial plate should go to the other column and one or two screws from the lateral column should go to the medial column. And that gives a fantastic uh, ability to uh, have a uh, good purchase as was emphasized by this diagram from the old disc call um, that each screw engages a fragment on the opposite side that is also attached to a plate. So this was his principle which, which uh, is well described. So what he said is this screw should go to the opposite column and from this plate also one or two screws should go to the opposite column. That makes a fantastic uh, screw fixation and this longish screw, this should be as long as possible. The problem was in the old discalls presentation, which is very well given in the view medi, this plate was actually on to the lateral aspect of the lateral condyle. What we usually use is the posterior lateral plate. So the screw configuration in the presentation and the screw configuration as we read in the literature is a bit different. In this, when the both the plates are on the medial and lateral column, then they have an interlacing place of screws. And in this, we don't require a lot of K-wires. But the plate which we are using is the posterior lateral as is shown in this diagram. So we are using a posterior lateral plate and the old discalls uh, description gives us a plate which is going on to the lateral aspect of the lateral column and then they interlace. So let us see in this the way we do it. So the intercondylar axis is well established. Here is a small combination of the capitulum which can be taken care of by laterally exposing that and putting a, a Herbert screw this uh, is lateral diagram, this coming to posterior approach. So we pass the K-wire, pass other column K-wire, reduce as much as you can do before with the K-wires. So that is the crux. So reduce them. You can have minute reductional things. Before putting the towel clip, one of the small tip is just drill with a 2 mm K-wire on medial column and a small onto the olecranon fossa so that the towel clip takes a nice position. Otherwise, it keeps on slipping. And then pass two or three screws here, pass two or three screws here, and, and, and complete the fixation. When there is a lot of combination, then I would take a K-wire from the lateral aspect of the column. As you can see here, this fragment is almost very small. So hold it with anything which you can hold with. Pass a column K-wire. Hold it nicely. As you can see, there are multiple pieces and then try to fix it. This is how I would like to uh, arrange. A any questions? Uh, most welcome. Previously, we used to mold the place uh, as accurately as possible, something like this. So these were non-locked constructs. So uh, even in such bad combinations, uh, we can take multiple small K-wires, small screws, so multiple K-wire fixations, so um, tension band like this. So these are the things to manage your combination. Gadigun sir, you are ready? with the Sir, any tips, any tips to pass the medial uh, plate, medial column plate? Because sometimes it comes on the medial, uh, medial lateral side. Yeah, 
the the because tip is something some hard something is there yeah the so medial reading. column medial column usually you will find one small comminution uh, very typical on the medial column that small comminution hold with a uh, sharp 1 mm or 1.2 mm k wire taken on a chuck and then drill it into position get it back into position mobilize the alder now take the medial plate and there are usually distal three screws so put the sleeve through the sleeve pass the k wire and then adjust either distal or proximal where it fits best then first put the metaphyseal screw once you put the metaphyseal screw again see the adjustment and when everything is okay then lock this is how i do it thank you so which indian and imported companies implant do you find fit best and do you insert screws in the flange that some plates have in the lateral column yeah the the flanges uh, at times remain proud so you may have to adjust flange with a very uh, very applicable uh, nose pliers you can have molding of that flange uh, however what i find is the question was uh, which company's plate fit best i find nothing like synthes they usually hold very well from indian companies uh, i am quite fond of uh, surat or zebone there the configuration of plate is quite good um, meril i did not find very very uh, anatomically comfortable uh, this this name i am taking just because uh, of their constant use there is a problem in uh, indian when you use a 2.7 screw uh, 2. Point, that is the problem they takle ho jata hai or it doesn't go inside and suppose if it is locked it is difficult to uh, remove it also so it's a indian company the problem with the not with the 3.5 uh, screw but it is with the 2.7 and 2.4 screw it's very difficult even in the uh, radius plate or your distal tbl plate or anywhere 2.4 2.7 Plate difficult. Are you agree with me, Tandak sir? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Surat uh, plate I like because not only while insertion, while removal also, Surat is quite comfortable. And Sarah uh, designed the uh, trochanteric plate for Surat and that plate and the metal is really good and their uh, machine manufacturing as I came to know from one of their bosses, uh, they are all imported machines what are used for the Synthesis manufacturing. Gadigone sir, you are ready to present your case? Uh, yeah, I will present distal humerus fracture if you have a time. Yes, sir. Uh, you are presenting that. Uh, distal humerus, I will present. Sir, what is the base thickness of SS wire and K wire for TBW? 1.8 is what is recommended for distal humerus and olecranon. However, at times we have used 2 mm also. So more, uh, more important thing is that they should be sharp. The bevel should not be very long. And while insertion, if you are able to cool them, that is best. So that the backing out is not there. Sandak sir, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, you are able to see. We are able to see, sir. So, the my presentation's learning objective is to understand the different types of distal humerus, extra articular fractures, and create a surgical tactic based upon the injury type and particular attention to the radial nerve palsy. Do nothing that will increase the complications. That is most important because. The distal humerus fracture is the most difficult fracture to treat in my, in my arena of fracture fixation because there are so many issues with the nerve injuries, stiffness of the elbow and infection. So it's the most important thing and don't take it lightly, the distal humerus fracture, whether it's extra-articular or intra-articular fractures. So issues, what are the issues with this extra articular fractures? Inadequate, inadequate compression at the fracture side because very distal fracture. We are talking of a distal means very distal fractures. 
inability to correct the sagittal plane, deformity, and management of medial communication and radial nerve injury. Now, why I say that inability to correct the sagittal plane deformity? Because we mostly do a posterior approach. And it is very difficult to assess the deforming forces on the anterior surface. And therefore, when you do an anatomical reduction also from the posterior aspect, your plate doesn't fit in the configuration of the distal humerus. And even after plating also, there is some deformity, anterior or posterior deformity in the distal humerus. So this is mostly overlooked because we see that by posterior approach, we can only appreciate the posterior structure and not the anterior structure. So at all, if you want to view the anterior structure, we have to take a very good CR picture and probably we'll have to assess by putting one of the hormones anteriorly and palpating the anterior surface, but that is a very difficult issue. And therefore, even after a good fixation in extra articular, very distal humerus structure, there are some issues with the sagittal plate deformity. So, loosening of the screw in osteoporotic bone. Because there is a forearm is there, there is only rotational movement that they occur at the very distal humeral structure and therefore one or two or three screws, they are unable to prevent the rotational, uh, unable to prevent the rotational uh, force and there may be a loosening of the screws in osteoporotic bones. So, this is a fracture. I will go step by bit. This is 22 year old with a complex uh, humerus fracture with a gross soft tissue injury. But this can be even managed. If you can manage it, 22 years, you can manage with the, with the cast also. Suppose if you give a molding cast for near about three weeks, reassess the deformity, and again, you can correct the deformity. So, this very well can be managed with the conservative treatment also. So this is how difficult to specify what is the best way to treat conservative nailing or plating. But this in the modern era, plating is now a gold standard because various plates are available like a posterior lateral plate and a medial breech plate may be required in this case. So how I treated this is with the tension band, a small anti-grade wires are put inside and one from the lateral condyle retrograde and is with a simple technique, the fracture is stabilized, short segment by bicondylar nail to the solid metaphyseal bone in the diaphysis and ultimately the fracture has united very nicely, minimal invasive treatment, no exposure of the fracture, probably with the exposure of the fracture, you will be able to see a most difficult thing to manage by plate also because distally it is a very, very small hole. But with the better now availability, this is now probably a 10 years old case, with the better availability of the posterior lateral plate, you can use now because your plate goes up to the distal end of the lateral condyle. The metallurgy is a close with negligible average to the patient, no blood transfusion, two stage suturing, no infection, biological fixation and early union. Disadvantage high exposure to radiation and functional brace support. Another case, a 32 year complex fracture with a multiple elastic nerve. This has also been treated with anti-grade. And you can see here they are finding in the uh, metaphyseal area up to the olecran and fossa. Though it's not a very strong fixation, but the prongs are going in a different direction and principle of push and rush nails. They are three point fixation and filling the canal has been done. And ultimately, you can see the fracture is wonderfully united with full punch. Electric nails can be effectively utilized, paying little respect to the reduction in stable fixation. Another example a male sustained a complex humerus fracture. No injury to the radial nail. Plate or nail, you can treat is very difficult fracture because of the butterfly fragment. Plating is a gold standard in this type of a fracture. And if the radial nerve is injury, 
there must be we have to explore the radial nerve and do the plating. So this is how nail to be successful ensure good purchase in the distal fragment. At least two locking screws, 2.5 centimeter away from the fracture site. So you must have a good purchase and it is possibly you can do by nailing if you are able to do at least two screws. This is how it is, planning, reaming of the distal fragment. And why reaming is important? It's because size and shape of the medullary canal and importance of reaming. So you can say it's like a very, this is not a very different kind of a medullary canal in the upper third, in the middle third, and in the lower third. So for circular nail to fit in the, the triangular canal, reaming is necessary. And by reaming the canal, we obtain more length in the distal segment of the fixation. So there is a different uh, diameter and different configuration of the medullary canal of the radius. And you can see here how the distal third fracture humerus can be managed by the internal nail in selected cases taking a proper precaution. An interlocking hole should come two to two five centimeter below the fracture site. Otherwise, it creates space either near the fracture. The, um, the working length is reduced and probably you may get a loosening of the screw. So in this case, you can say reaming and placement of the implant superior border of the olecranon without perforating the posterior cortex. And you can see leaving behind these, uh, these uh, without uh, interfering the butterfly fragment, and you can see everything healed around the nail. If there is a stable fixation in a comminuted fracture, forget about the anatomical reduction of the comminuted pieces and butterfly fragment. If the osteoperosteal sleeve is intact, it will heal around the nail, provided it has a stable configuration. So this is another example. You can see a bilateral fracture, very distal fracture, middle third fracture. Both are treated by minimal invasive interlock nail on the both the side and this fracture is united. So another example, if it is not done properly, you can see here. The, if it is not done properly, this is the fracture treated by a wrong principle of nailing because nail has not gone up to the olecranon fossa, the near the screw fracture, space riser, and you can see what has happened. There is a breakage of the nail and breakage of the screw. It is not the fault of the nail. It is the fault of a person who is doing the nailing because he has not followed the principle of nailing. So just putting the nail inside and locking it will not heal. There are so many other factors they are enemy of the nailing where the fracture does not unite. Failure layers are nail, failures of nail are many, and it's not favored in the treatment of distal humerus fracture. And you can see this is another example. This is same thing. You can see here the fracture was distracted and it was locked both the side, and therefore. There was a non-union and ultimately there is a loosening single screw fixation, resorption and the non-union. So this is how it is, why the patient has gone into non-union, not because of the nail, but because of the technical error of doing surgery in both the cases. So what we have to do? A approach to this distal humerus should be less traumatic, respect of the soft tissues, and protection of the neurovascular bundle. So why posterior approach in revision cases? Lens chance of damage to the vital structure. Posterior structures are aponeurotic and dissection is easier with less bleeding. Better visualization of particular surface and they, therefore we use out of the four, whether tricep splitting approach, osteotomy approach, tricep reflecting approach or tricep serving approach. So these are the approaches and according to the situation, we have to use these approaches. Now this is the same removal of the nail of that same case, excision of fibrous tissue, singling, 
plate fixation and bone grafting and you can see how this radial no is isolated. The first is isolation of the radial nerve, tingling, and this bone fracture you can see here. Then it is aligned properly, plating is done, and bone grafting is done. Though the plate on the lateral condyle is inadequately placed, follow up excessos, a good fixation. And now, this is you can see, appreciate this is my case. I have done some mistake. And you can see the, the plate should have gone up to this place so that it gives a better purchase. Also, the plate should be here. Plate should be here, not here at the olecranon age. It should be at the condylar age. So ultimately, this fracture has united. And you can see the, your plate should go down. These are 2.7 screws. That is how what I was telling that they are very difficult to put and keep uh, inside. And when you have remove it, there are so many difficulties in Indian plates. So this is how it is. Two years follow up, patient has completely united with the singling opposition of these interplex through posterior plate and bone grafting. Another case, 20 year old male, RTA, no associated injury. No neurovascular bungal, single locking plate construct was planned. And you can see triceps splitting approach. Split depends on the degree of exposure needed. And ultimately, you can see here beautifully there is a interfragment screw. The plate is nicely placed and extra article immediate post op and fracture united perfectly. One year follow up post of restoration of the anatomy. Another example, a 42 year female, spiral fracture associated with a butterfly fragment, grass swelling with radial nerve palsy, Levistin, Holistin Levis type of a fracture. This is because of this tip of this injures the radial nerve. So in such a situation, no close treatment, whatever it may be, whether it is reducible or still you need to do exploration of the radial nerve, bringing back the anatomy together. And in that case, and then and then only, we have to fix it by one plate or two plates. So this is the same tricep preserving approach, paratricipal, and fixation by plate after isolation of the radial nerve. And this is how it is being done. There is inter this uh, uh, compression screw, you can see. And ultimately, with a single screw, with two, this is the interflex screw, three interflex screw, one, two, and three. This is beautifully fixed. Uh, and you can see here how nicely the fracture is united. One year follow, full function and full movement. Another example, a 20 year male, multiple, this is the butterfly fragment treated by osteopath. One month old fracture treated with lateral side of butterfly fragment. And then ultimately, you can see here lateral to medial, Garvin's approach. I used it. And because the butterfly fragment was on the medial side, therefore, I wanted to see this as well as the radial nerve. You can see here how it was very near to the butterfly fragment. Easy to dissect after isolation of radial nerve up to the deltoid. And insertion and placement of plate underneath the radial nerve. And this is how it is a perfect anatomical restoration, clamping of the butterfly fragment. And you can see here the plate was used. And this is the uh, image for past x-ray. You can see this seven to eight centimeter from the lateral condyle. Usually your radial nerve is there. And Dr. Sama, one of the fellow from our group has posted a very beautiful picture where there is a aponeurosis ends and about near about two centimeters within, there is a radial nerve. So here is the aponeurosis ending, and you can see this probably the location of this radial nerve. That is a beautiful diagram he has posted in the group. Immediate post-op X-ray, this is the check X-ray, and you can see here how beautifully within three months the fracture has united and complete restoration of the anatomy. Another example, a 45-year male, vehicle accident, 
Holistin Lewis fracture, spiral fracture distal one third of the humeral stab. 22% incidence associated with the fracture. Mostly it is a neuropraxia. Still, we must explore the nerve when you get the radial nerve palsy. Even if you get anatomical reduction, still don't do a close technique or close nailing. Open it, see the radial nerve, and whatever whether you want to do a nailing or plating, you can do it. So this is how the X-ray selection of approach, tricep preserving approach, paratricep approach I used allows simultaneous fixation, and this is how the two pillars are to be stabilized because very very distal humerus fracture is there and medial butterfly fragment with the spiral fracture. Reconstruction of both uh, columns are needed. This is the paratripecetypal approach. Full thickness palisiocutaneous flaps are elevated. The medial and lateral border of triceps are incised, are erased from their respective intermuscular septum. <clears throat> All intermuscular septum. Be aware of this uh, radial nerve into the intermuscular section, isolation of the ulnar nerve, and then raising the collapse superficial to the ulnar nerve with tagging. And this is the tagging of this ulnar nerve, tricep preserving approach, first on the medial side, and then on the lateral side. And you can see here the plate, posterior lateral plate, and medial supporting plate to the buttressing effect on the uh, butterfly fragment and you can see a beautiful restoration of anatomy and a union with the this is the uh, this is the lateral posterior lateral plate medial plate and interflex proof so i have to have a many number of cases to share but a few cases are i'm sharing extra articular fractures requires two pillar support this is the extra articular fracture. But if you take a CT scan, probably you may have a, some split here. Therefore, it is not the paratricipal approach or a other approach. Best is the approach here is the olecranon osteotomy approach. You can treat with the paratricipal approach. I have treated with the paratricipal approach. But today, if you ask me, probably I will do a olecranon osteotomy approach, too much juggling here and there for this uh, paratricipital approach because we have to put the distally and you will not be able to see the articular surface fully. So it's a just assumption that your articular surface is in good position. Another, so young adult treated by plate, distal humerus fracture. So the screw near the fracture these are the three, three screw here. There is a distraction. And you can see, as I said, it's very difficult to see the anterior part. The posteriorly, it was looking very nicely, but anteriorly, there is some gap. Ultimately, what has happened? This fracture has failed. So failure of plate is most common in the distal humerus fracture. We have to adhere to the principles of the management of the a plating also on this type of a plate in a distal humerus does not work. It needs a up to this, the posterior plate is required. And with this, you must have a compression. With some bending of the plate is required. You must assess before closing the lateral picture is the so is there any anterior gap is there? Because any gap on the posterior or anterior aspect. I step precursor to the failure of the subject. So take home basis, choose appropriate implant, choose the appropriate approach, safeguard the ulnar and uh, radial nerve, respect the soft tissue, stable reduction, fixation and early rehabilitation is the key to the subject. Thank you very much. Sandak sir. Sir. Gadigoni sir, thank you so much for uh, distal humerus fracture. <clears throat> so, any questions to Gadigoni sir? Sir, you explore the nerve in every case, mid-shaft fracture with a nadine or palsy. 
radial nerve palsy you must explore the nerve that is my dictum Somebody even if it is mid sharp yes if it is radial nerve is injured because sometimes it is a guesswork if you do a nailing and just observe for some time probably after three months you may get a uh, improvement but it's just a so have a look and see it is only a neurophragia you are definitely you will be able to convince to the patient that one day you will have a good recovery to the radial nerve. in how many cases you find that uh, it's it was cut sir no no i have not never seen a cut uh, radial nerve. then what we are doing after exploring the nerve sometime it is a impinging impinging over the fragment and probably it may deter your neurological function so just observe it see it and if at all it is uh, Uh, jetting against the one of the fragment, you can reduce it properly so that the pressure over that particular contours radial nerve will be reduced. Sangeet, you also that can be that can be done also by reducing the fracture. What we are adding to after exploring the nerve. So, but once you once you have a radial nerve, you want to be hundred percent sure that you haven't missed out anything. If it is, if you try to do the close reduction, and if the if the nerve is between the two fragments of the bone. Then it will further damage the nerve. So it is. I feel it is. Uh, it is safe to go down, see the nerve, and then fix up the bone, whatever way to fix it up. So that now you know that the nerve has a almost hundred percent chance of recovery. Thank you. Is that very clear, Rakesh? Yes. What 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 you wanted to suggest? You would not like to explore in some cases. If the Close mid-shaft fracture, then we don't need. Usually, you don't uh, explore the nerve, even if there I is a palsy. even if there is a palsy. Yes. Statistically, eighty-five to ninety-five maximum people will recover automatically. But whether you want to take that chance, whether you and me had a fracture, what will be? Are we going to remain on that eighty-five, or you want a hundred percent recovery chance? This is how it is. You have to look at. By exploring the run, we are not adding anything. Sir. We are we are taking out the uncertainty of now being trapped between the fracture. That we will do because we are reducing the fracture by anterior lateral plating. I mean, we don't need to explore the nerve from. Do uh, by anterior lateral plating without seeing the nerve. So Rakesh, but, Rakesh, I got your point. What you mean to say? What you mean to say is, say you are taking a anterior lateral approach or a posterior approach. So you are reducing the fracture. That means you are excluding that nerve is trapped in the fracture site. Yes. Yeah. So okay, that's fine. Absolutely fine. A brachialis supplet approach. If you yeah. So you you are excluding that nerve is trapped in the fracture site. Because. A uh, surgeon like our, our setup. Sometimes we are a fear that we may add on damage to the already neuroparaxis. Hardly ever. If you are a surgeon, hardly ever you will damage the nerve while exploring and trying to really release it from the bone or anywhere it is. Hardly ever you will be able to do that. Yeah, Rakesh, this would never. See, every time you would dissect a ulnar nerve for a fracture of supracondylar humerus. Yes. We are exploring nerves. So we explore them longitudinally. Our dissections are placed longitudinally, and yes. even if we handle the nerve, it is always gentle, careful, knowing the knowing the stretchability of nerve. So that that question doesn't usually. What Tanna sir says is, you would hardly ever, as a surgeon, you would unless unless you are not uh, along the uh, traditional anatomical zones. Yes, that is, I think, orthopedic surgeon first principles. Or if you try to do the surgery by avoiding to explore the nerve, then inevitably it might damage. But yes. if the nerve, then you will hardly ever damage. Yes. It would just yes, add sir. Not it. exploring, not exploring would have more chances of uh, giving traction to the nerve than uh, this one, sir. Yes. And one more thing, sir, we have to pass the plate below the nerve, so we have to dissect it, if and we have to explore. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, Negi sir, you are presenting your uh, yeah. ankles. So, yeah. there is uh, there is a, uh, somebody is showing it. So, uh, let him finish. Radial nerve palsy. That is. Yes, sir, has finished. 
Negeshwar, you continue with this case because we are in the process of same nor policy. Oh, yeah. So, I think this is Sangeet's uh, lecture. Radial nor policy with sharp humerus. Ah, ye tera hai ke Sangeet? Yeah. yeah, this is mine. Okay. Okay. You continue. So this is the current evidence what is in uh, uh, the literature about the radial nerve. Okay. Good, 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 Sangeet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, please. Go ahead. I think we are today we are talking about the humerus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes. So I was okay. to put that slight fracture which you have a presentation. Shear, shear fracture. Shear fractures. I'll just load it then. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Can you carry on, Sangeet? Yes. Now, uh, uh, there has been various controversies, like even between us. Uh, what is the decision, how, whether you should explore it, whether you should conserve it, whether uh, a fracture requires uh, exploration of the nerve. So what is the current evidence today, as of today? This is March 23. Okay. Now, we all know what is the anatomy of the radial nerve and we are concerned about this deficit, which can happen either uh, with the conservative treatment or with the operative treatment. Now, uh, in short, about the, radi uh, about the anatomy. Now, uh, posteriorly descends in the spinal gro groove, in the spiral groove, but it is not in directly contact with the bone uh, because here on the medial side, it is the brachialis muscle uh, which separates the nerve from the bone. Okay. And the only area where it is in direct contact is instead along the lateral metaphyseal flare distally. The radial nerve is tethered where it pierces the lateral intramuscular septum. That means from the radial groove, from the radial groove, it comes at the level of intramuscular septum and then it goes anteriorly. So this is the area where it is very tight and very close to the a humerus bone and that is the most dangerous area. Now, how do you locate the nerve? It is about 14 centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle. That is where it comes in the spiral groove on the medial side from the lateral epicondyle. If you are at the level of 14 centimeter in an averagely built or averagely heighted patient, it is at that location. It lies directly on the posterior aspect of the humerus at for a distance of about 6.7 centimeters. And the nerve pierces the lateral intermuscular septum approximately 10 centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle and it enters the lateral compartment. So medially 10, 14 centimeters, then it crosses the humerus for a distance of 6.5 millimeters. Okay. And then on the lateral side, it pierces at an average about 10 centimeters proximal to the uh, lateral epicondyle. So these are the landmarks of the radial nerve. Now, where, what is the risk to the medial nerve in various areas? Middle third, it has a 7% risk. In distal third, it is about 13%. And in spiral fractures like this, it has about 16% risk. Now, radial nerve, we have different categories of presentation. First is a radial nerve palsy at the presentation. Like a humerus coming to you, 10% is the incidence. Okay. And uh, conservative treatment is advocated because mo more than 90% will recover without the need of any intervention. So a uh, fracture shaft humerus which is minimally displaced, coming to you with a radial nerve palsy. And if you have decided to conserve it, don't explore for the radial nerve. It is very likely in 10 out of 9 patients, it will recover within 7 weeks, ranging from 2 weeks to 6.5 weeks. Okay, Early exploration has not been shown to improve the outcome, except in cases of open fractures or concomitant forearm injuries. Okay. There is no reason to solely operate on a closed humerus shaft fracture because there is a radial nerve palsy after the trauma. 
as almost all the palsies will recover spontaneously without a secondary intervention and clinical monitoring is initially the only thing what is required. I'm quoting the articles at, uh, uh, at the low bottom of all the statements what I'm making. Radial nerve palsy in patients with a humeral shaft fracture at presentation functionally recovers in about 90 to 94%. These are all the latest article. This one is published recently. Moreover, patients which are managed uh, operatively for a closed humeral shaft fracture have a significant higher risk of developing a secondary radial nerve palsy. That means a fracture uh, which is closed, which is minimally displaced. And if you try to open those fractures, there is a high risk, a significantly higher risk of developing a iatrogenic radial nerve palsy in them. So that is why in, they recommend in simple fractures, close low energy fractures where the humerus is minimally displaced, conservative track, even if you have a radial nerve palsy, continue the conservative treatment. Where do you require uh, exploration? In a close humerus where there, are, there is a high energy fracture, where there is an open injury, where there is a concomitant fracture of the proximal humerus, humerus shaft, uh, and you have uh, something in the elbow or in the forearm. These are the one which require, these are the one, these are the patients who have a radial nerve palsy. In them, it is recommended to explore them. This is again by the article, old article. Now, uh, uh, what is the chance of developing a radial nerve palsy in the patients whom you are conserving? The incidence is about 0.4%. And the one which you have explored, the chances of iatrogenic palsies are about 4%. So non-operative treatment in closed humeral shaft fracture, if the fracture is expected to heal, well with non-operative treatment, then there is no reason to explore that radial nerve. Early exploration is recommended in secondary palsy after close reduction, distal third humerus, including holstein Lewis fracture, open fractures, penetrating injury, associated vascular injury, high velocity gunshot injury, severe soft tissue injuries. Out of these, the first two, that is a secondary palsy after close reduction or fractures associated with holstein Lewis fracture, both are no longer considered definitive indications for early exploration with larger studies showing higher rate of spontaneous recovery. Okay. Uh, early exploration the probability of recovery after observation is less than 40%. So the treatment option includes tendon transfer, direct repair with or without grafting, nerve transfer or combination procedures, which are considered when you are doing a early exploration and even you find out there is a radial nerve laceration or uh, axon mesis. Radial nerve palsy in patients with humeral shaft fracture where you have a iatrogenic complication, even in them, the chances of recovery are 89%. Only 11% are not going to recover. And they require subsequently, after observation, uh, those procedures which we discussed in the earlier slide. Why do we have to explore er, uh, early? Because there are higher, nerve, higher rates of nerve entrapment, which are seen in 6 to 25% cases nerve lacerations which are reported in 20 to 42 percent that can be repaired before scarring when the nerve is maximally mobile so that means uh, in those cases where there is a high uh, velocity injury where there is a shaft femur along with radial nerve palsy in them these are the findings and that is the reason they recommend early exploration in those indicated groups and here, the chances of, uh, since you can mobilize the nerve easily, the chances of uh, nerve repair, I mean direct repair or a requiring graft are minimized because 
the nerve is easily is much more mobile than when you do a late exploration post operative radial nerve palsy the incidence is about uh, 3 to 7% Three to seven percent is the incidence when you are actually handling the nerve. And what is the reason? Where you can see here in this video, the nerve, the spike of that this fracture is so close to the nerve, which has been isolated here. And uh, during the close manipulation of this fracture, or while doing surgery, if you are not careful, if you are not uh, explored the spikes distally and proximally to reduce that. And without exploring the nerve clearly, if you try to reduce that, it is very likely that you will have a iatrogenic complication. So nerve identification during secondary surgical procedure showed very few partial or no complete macroscopic lesion of radial nerve, suggesting that radial nerve palsy is mostly a temporary neuropraxia. Now, this patient had a neurological deficit and obviously there was no contusion there was no laceration, there was no, uh, uh, the nerve was nearly normal. So if you explore the nerve carefully, and that has to be done from proximal to distal, the chances of iatrogenic nerve palsy are very less further. If it is a neuropraxia, it is likely to recover if you have fixed it well. Plate osteosynthesis with ORIF allows the radial nerve, the implant placement, the soft tissue handling, the retraction, and intraoperative nerve exploration, the risk reduces the risk of iatrogenic nerve damage. Uh, now, this is how, if once you fix it, your radial nerve will smoothly glide over the implant, and thereby uh, there will be an appropriate condition or environment for the nerve to recover. If there are spikes, if your reduction is not proper, it is uh, repeated injury again while mobilizing the patient and that will further damage the nerve. So uh, what is the relation of surgical exposure and the radial nerve palsy? One in five patients uh, will have uh, iatrogenic transient dysfunction with a lateral exposure. One in nine patients with the posterior exposure and one in 25 patients in anterolateral exposures. So the lateral exposures where, where the nerve is tethered, have a higher chances of iatrogenic transient dysfunction as compared to posterior or an anterolateral approach. Now, uh, this was a study where it was a multi-center study. It's a Hummer study, which is the largest uh, multi-center study, where they concluded that plating resulted in more post-operative temporary radial nerve palsy as compared to the nailing, but the non-union were higher in the nailing group as compared to the plating. Okay. Now, how do you evaluate the recovering radial nerve? One should assess the motor and the sensory deficit, strength of the potential donor muscles and the passive joint movement. A migrating tinnel sign is a good prognostic indicator. MRI and ultrasound have a limited use. EMG and nerve conduction velocities are rarely helpful in acute stage. They are recommended to be done at three to four months after the injury. And then uh, exploration can be undertaken if there is a low conduction, but repair remains the option even at five to six months after the injury. Use of the ultrasound as a diagnostic modality in patients with radial nerve palsy after humerus shaft fracture has been more common over the years and it is currently actually not a standard diagnostic workup protocol. But still, most of the surgeons are using that as a modality to find out what is a conduction which is occurring at two months, four months, six months or uh, to find out if there is no recovery, where is the level of radial nerve injury or where it is the radial nerve is entrapped. Its ability to accurately diagnose entrapment or lesions of radial nerve with a sensitivity and a specificity of 89 and 95 percent. Late exploration, most common strategy for persistent palsy. 
late surgery gives a 69% chance of recovery in a setting of humeral shaft fracture with a 31% risk of no recovery at the end of treatment. Although repair performed within five months will still be superior to muscle or tendon transfer, which we have to do it later. When you have a situation or non-union, we cannot really isolate the radial nerve. It has to be en masse because to explore in the, in the condition where there is an extensive fibrosis, here you don't have to see the radial nerve. Whatever structure, let it, don't try to separate the radial nerve. Let it attach to the muscle or the fibrous tissue and then retract it en masse to get your surgery perfectly. So conclude, more than 90% will recover without the need for any intervention. Early exploration has been shown not to improve the outcomes. Spontaneous recovery around seven weeks, ranging from two weeks to 6.5 months is norm. Non-surgical management should be performed for at least uh, six, eight weeks. If no recovery was observed by eight weeks, then surgery should be performed. MRI and ultrasound have been shown to have a limited use. Post-operative radial nerve palsy range from only 5, 3 to 7%. Thank you very much. So that was about what is latest in the radial nerve palsy. So, Sanjeev, Sanjeev, you added in my knowledge. Yes, yes uh, sir. Thank you. thank you very much. So it looks all strategies are okay. This is only applies to where you treat the radial, uh, the, where you treat the humerus fracture shaft. Surgically. If you're going to do the operation for the fracture itself, grossly displaced fracture. Are you going to conserve them or you are not going to see them now? Uh, no, no, sir. What I mean to say is like we have a fear if a patient comes to us with a radial nerve palsy, whether he's going to recover or not. And on the basis, like that is if you are, if he is an indicated case of a conservative management, we can continue the conservative management. If it is a low velocity, uh, simple fracture, just because he has a radial nerve palsy does not warrant him or a surgeon to operate one. Okay. That was uh, the conclusion. And uh, even if you have iatrogenic chances, uh, iatrogenic injury, it is very likely almost in say eight or nine out of 10 patients, it is going to, going to recover. So what Rakesh was suggesting also had a slide which favored him. Yes. Yes, exactly. That is the reason like he was talking the truth. Yes. Yeah. Another truth. See, there can be different institutional, different uh, protocols. We have to understand science and philosophy. Yeah. Right. Sure, sir. But it is ultimately an individual sir. choice. Sir. According to you, uh, that is an indication for humorous fixation. But we may differ amongst ourselves. The, yes. the decision can be different for a different surgeon. Sanjit. Yeah. Sanjit. Sangeet, if you have a case like a distal humerus comminuted fracture with radial nor palsy, anyhow it can be sometime treated with the conservative method also. Yes. So suppose the conservatively you have managed in a young boy, suppose probably the non-union may not occur. In that case, if the radial nerve is there, will you advocate him a surgical or a non-surgical? And uh, exploration of nerve or not? Because if you want to go anteriorly, then possibly you may not. But if you want to go posteriorly, and a distal humerus fracture, that is one of the most favored approach. So definitely we will try to explore the nerve. So, second, second, like uh, what conclusion we can draw is, like if you have a radial nerve palsy, and if you have decided to open it, or, so that, or fix it, so it has to be posterior approach. It has to be posteriorly plated. It cannot be plated anteriorly. You cannot nail those fracture. You cannot do a close procedure. You cannot do a MIPO. So that is another good conclusion what uh, can be drawn from all what I have spoken. Absolutely.
सर्जिकली मैनेज एंडल पेशंट इफ यू वॉन्ट द सर्जरी इज इंडिकेटेड देन एक्सप्लोर द नॉर एंड फिक्स इफ द सर्जरी इज नॉट इंडिकेटेड probably they can be conserved uh, yes really yes. are nailing turn in that case probably you may not explore the nor and do a conservative yes. treatment or a, a close treatment yes so can we ourselves repair the nerve or should we always have a plastic guy are tum sabhi kar do na har har jo udai kar do yes sir you, you ask all these people with 40 50 years of experience how many cut radian now we have seen there will not be five examples amongst all of us so is only the neurolysis which is required for which you don't require a plastic surgeon it's only okay. is a contusion that's yeah. it you don't have to repair it that's extremely extremely rare six uh, surgeon has more experience of radial now <laughs> than the orthopedic <laughs> uh, thank you sir plastic surgeon ko kuch nahi aata usme wo kaha radial nerve ek karte ho रिपेयर नहीं करते दे कैन डू इट इंडन ट्रांसफर रिपेयर यू कैन डू इट व्हाट इज देयर एनीवे अभी तो अचीम अभी तो बहुत टाइम हो गया नेक्स्ट टाइम अगली अगली बार अगली बार अगली अगली बार अगली बार अगली बार अचीम नेगी इन द बैट्समैन ओपनिंग आई एम सॉरी सर आई वाज आई वाज डिलेड इन द ओपीडी रोज 8 बजे छूट रहा मैं 1 बजे अंदर घुसता हूं और 8 बजे निकला मैं आई एम सॉरी अरे बहुत पेशेंट खींच रहा है तू इंदौर के पूरे के पूरे <laughs> बाकी का कैसा होगा क्वेश्चंस ऑन दैट लास्ट लेक्चर दैट वाज इंटरेस्टिंग किसी किसी को पूछना हो तो पूछ लीजिए अभी रियली वेरी कॉन्ट्रोवर्शियल टॉपिक सर आई वांट टू से व्हेन फ्रैक्चर लो वेलोसिटी Uh-huh. we should do a usg so just to document the in, uh, the radial now is not uh, salvage in between because of the fragments yeah i think that is see all all uh, precautions from medical angle medical legal angle would always be taken in this situation so not what- for a medical legal if if something has to be done then we can take it immediate action sometimes what happens even fracture segments uh, they migrate and they come back to the original position mm-hmm. in that scenario we don't know what has happened actually inside but then uh, the the uh, ultrasound imaging for radial nerve in a acute traumatic stress factor uh, one second chandak sir one second yeah. anirudh the the, yes, place, the place where you are practicing kitna log kar can you can you <laughs> can you with guarantee say with guarantee that he'll give you exact diagnosis that sonologist what yes. is the caliber of that sonologist uh, who can guarantee you that his report is perfect Actually, there, are, no. there are few sonologists in pune yeah. in uh, dinanath mangeshkar and jupiter we gives the good good uh, reporting for okay. now okay but i think you know, like think patient no, no, getting it no harm in getting it done so see i i think such situations need to be worked up with three principles one you put the science behind it number two your own experience number three the counseling sessions you have with the patient and number four follow the logical path after all the investigations you have assessed i and think that, that i would agree totally agree no and problem. that itself has a fallacy of about 10% yes that that everyone has to know so, so where do we stand then chanda sab it requires special muscular skeletal fine probes and they are expensive so every sonographer doesn't have them yeah, but then thing is what dr anirudh wants to say is there is absolutely no harm in getting a investigation yeah. which would be valuable non invasive investigation imagine, imagine a close relative and what is happening whether the nerve is pressed not pressed you will get a mri you will get everything done for that patient if he is your own relative so he has a logic i, I totally agree with him so, so if no, you so what, get what, a humerus shaft then if with a radial nerve palsy then would you um, go for posterior only then yeah or posterior approach only so that approach sure. gives you a exploration of nerve for a wider zone from anterior laterally also you can just assess the nerve and uh, the garvin's approach gives you a more 
more elaborate approach to explore. So you will have to fashion out what uh, is the situation. Sir, no conduction test uh, done by after three months, sir. Or early days only we can take. So three early, weeks? Uh, three before weeks. three weeks, it has no value. Three so, months. Three months. Not three weeks. Earlier, earlier phase only ultrasound, sir. So, Sangeet, what do you suggest for earlier phase? Uh, earlier, like within two, two to six weeks, all of them are going to recover. Uh, no, so sir. Hydrogenic or conservative. His question is... Yes, yes, I am coming to it. Yeah. I am coming to it. The most diagnostic sign is a clinical recovery. Right. A migrating recovery. Like your brachioradial is recovering. Then your extensors recovering. Then your forearm recovering. By the time you have three weeks, four weeks. So early exploration. See, what does it, uh, EMG and nerve conduction tells us? It is a fasciculation of the muscles. So okay. what is going? What is it going to tell? Because in six weeks, uh, it is not going to tell you that whether now uh, neuropraxia. If it is not a neuropraxia, all other category, it is not going to tell you anything. So it is not going to contribute anything. Neither it can tell you where exactly the nerve is blocked. So Sir, that's the reason they say if you have to do do it at three months, where uh, you where the extensors have started recovering, extensor muscles have started recovering, and then either if they have not recovered, you can make a decision then that it is unlikely to recover because that distance of the nerve from the spiral groove to the lateral epicondyle to the to the uh, level where the radial nerve starts innervating the common extensors, it it uh, crosses that level by three months. So that is the reason they recommend do it at three months. Before that, probably it doesn't contribute to the diagnosis. The early phase ultrasound, anything else, sir? See, you can do MRI, you can do ultrasound, what suits you. Okay. The ultrasound can trace the uh, continuity of nerve. So also MRI neurography can also trace the continuity of nerve, but they are not 100%. Okay. If it shows you something, it is fine. If it doesn't show, then again you are speculating. But that doesn't change your decision. Yes. You cannot make a decision uh, even if something positive comes at that, say, four months. Still, uh, ideally, you should give re recommended time for the neuropraxia to recover. Yes. Uh, ideally, investigation should solve the dilemma in mind. And many times that dilemma would continue. However... Or increase or probably increase. So you, you always would do investigation. In last of uh, two cases, we had a, a MRI neurography which showed uh, continuity of nerve, which was we were able to convince the patient to wait and they recovered. So it, it is all counseling and what you see, particular direction, what displacement, everything has to be taken into account. See, one decision would not be binding for all the cases. No, sir, so because, because I have learned, learned to one of my cases. When yeah. fracture was looking minimally displaced and patient yeah. had a radial nerve palsy. Yes. And I just did a screening of radial nerve where it was a radial nerve was cut. Okay. So you were benefited with that investigation. With, yeah. yeah. We appreciate that. Absolutely. So, so if investigation is aiding you in either prognostication or management of a case, I think that's a valid investigation. No problem. Absolutely fine. But you Means cannot generalize, generalize for every case. No, it is a, like a screening tool. Yes, it is a screening tool. I agree. Any other questions? Sangeet, sir. Yes. Middle one-third fracture humerus with small butterfly with radial nerve palsy. How will you approach? 35-year male. Uh, that depends on whether you want to fix it or or manage him conservatively. What will be your opinion? No, no. Discipline. No, you have you have told there is a comminuted sharp middle third humerus with radial nerve palsy. Yeah. Now the second issue is how much is the displacement? So most likely, if it's a butterfly, it, it will be displaced. Okay. Okay. So uh, if the X-ray alignment is good, I would conserve it. 
unless the patient is very high demand patient. If high demand, then posterior plating. Posterior plating. Explore the nerve, see the nerve, and plate posteriorly. But uh, again, being a middle third, the chances of recovery are, I would say, more than ninety five percent. So in Mumbai, Sangeet, you are uh, a high demand patient. Sangeet, yes, you are a high demand patient yourself or high low demand patient. No, the expectations of the patient. Uh, he wants to go back as early as possible to the office. where he is only sole member of a family where you know like uh, i played him and uh, say in about 2 weeks time he starts I using his hand he is staying alone he is working in office he can go back to the office rather than putting him in a plaster continuing it for 6 weeks or 2 months that where he cannot do his personal hygiene he cannot wear you know like situation where uh, you know in periphery where they are staying with family here they are staying individually so things are totally different so you, there cannot be same set of rules for patients who are in periphery and in the uh, a very cooperative and understanding patient for conservative treatment is more rigorous more yeah. rigorous and and today you know even though we know that say 20 30 degrees of angulation in a uh, ap plane or 20 30 degrees of rotation is acceptable but you know like seeing the x rays to them it is a displacement where uh, they are likely to question that it is angulated at the end so no input things are different again? come again sir no no uh, that was absolutely valid what you said i said nitin had no inputs today myself yeah <laughs> uh nice sir that, that all the lectures were fantastic i can share two, two of my experiences sir uh two times i have found the radial nerve cut okay they were closed fractures not open and i was plating from the posterior side only thing i would advise that uh, if you find uh, such type of uh, this thing, scenario then you should tuck the edge of the radial nerve with non absorbable sutures in the muscle so after uh, whenever later on you need to no. repair the nerve it becomes very easy to trace them absolutely valid. absolutely valid point and that is usually done by all and all. second and you can mention the at which uh, hole of the plate that uh, tucking was done that yes. also becomes uh, easier for the plastic surgeon another yes. experience that i uh, had twice uh, i uh, a radial nerve palsy with fracture humerus i was tracing the nerve and i could not find the nerve sir at the regular place so i went proximally mid till the axilla and distally towards the lateral intervascular septum and to my surprise when i traced them then from distal to middle and proximal to middle the nerve were tapped anteriorly it has gone anterior to the fragment <laughs> and it was a hell of a work to bring that nerve uh, after the reduction before the reduction posterior and do the reduction and then do the plate so this can also happen yes you don't find the nerve then it is always anterior it has gone anterior so in mumbai so in mumbai when you conserve the patient uh, how frequently do you conserve it and do you use the high end 50000 60000 burge or other company braces that have computer aided system to align the uh, fracture fragments no 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 none of, none of like that the surgery ho jayega a simple plaster a cast thank you mumbai very rare to get a conservative treatment very rare sir posterior plate is ideal or anterior plate is ideal i do posterior many of them they do anterior also middle third depends on the institution which you had had a experience and your own experiences both are fine tanna sir most commonly does uh, middle third and proximal third anterior plates so for non union and fine anterior dissection to be much better because you can place more amount of graft in a posterior plate in middle third you can't put lot of graft there because of the nerve so i find anterior better so situations would demand that both are fine absolutely for humerus middle third both approaches could be fine chandak sir upper third and distal third there is no dispute upper third is anterior 
the distal third is posterior. The middle third is surgeon's choice. If there is a radial now, you ought to go posterior. There is no dispute. Right. Yeah. So to, to me, um, it is always posterior. The reason is they don't see the scar. Otherwise, they keep on bothering. Scar, itna, it's, it's so big. It is so bad now. That is one. And second, <laughs> for both radius alna and uh, I played them. Middle third, distal third humerus, radius alna. I played them because they can go back to office in about two weeks time. Okay. Earliest, mm -hmm. earliest to their leaving. Four days, five days. Yeah. yeah. You know, those who are in office, they can go back. Those who are in private jobs or those who are doing their individual business. So here, see, it is calculated as a loss per day. Yes. Uh, right. And everybody is hand to mouth. Nobody can afford, lo uh, afford lo uh, losses. So that is the reason uh, things probably change for us. Hello. This sir, is one small doubt, sir. Some hardly, of them hardly get to conserve a humerus. They come only for surgery. I, I, I would beg to differ. No, no, no. I'm honest to the core. Suppose in the bottom of my heart, if I feel that this fracture can be conserved, I tell them, look, this is these are the pros and cons. And mm -hmm. most of them choose surgery because of the reasons Sangeet said. So I, I I would like to somehow uh, not agree to that because last month we had a chance to treat more than fifteen patients conservatively, and uh, yeah. all of them are doing well. And it is uh, it we is because you were too busy with the other surgeries. You say that no? <laughs> so other better good. surgeries you had to do. That is why you conserved them. No no for if humans. You would, if your <laughs> other surgeries would have been less, you would have operated them. No, I for humorous, I believe conservative. No, no, he treats uh, Harjo, Harjo's humorous also, he conserved. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So humorous, Harjo had come prepared for admission actually, but uh, I, I find a lot of benefits. One um, strong benefit is obviously uh, no surgery, no need to remove implant, and uh, healing is fast. What you say, Sangeet, that they can't go back to their work, and most of these patients are the only initial 15 days are. Uh, troublesome. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, even if you take Harjot's case, one month he was operating actually with, with everything mm -hmm. on. So, yeah, after one month, I even attended web conferences and after my own humorous experience, I have, I have conserved more than 20 cases and only one case I faced delayed union, but none, no, none of the patients came back for surgery. And I have almost all patients complete follow up. Man, uh, sir, uh, what uh, what fractures, sir? Had Harjot sir had humerus, middle third humerus, displaced middle third humerus. Sir, sir small one, video for close reduction and casting. Yeah, I'll present a whole uh, uh, presentation. Please, I'm very, very fond of uh, humerus uh, conservative treatment. You um, apply you cast, sir. You cast. Uh, it depends actually either you cast or a hanging it depends situation changes depending on the site depending on site and depending on the position so and all, all 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 these patients are so happy that you you can't imagine a happier patient than a conservatively treated humorous patient but uh, of course i would agree that uh, uh, surgery has a very valid role i would not like to change anybody's thought process this is how i treat there can be variations. So, do you use Sarmiento braces? Uh, no. Uh, the problem was uh, Sarmiento braces were uh, difficult to manage, and our own plaster casting is much, much more comfortable. Uh, what we do is, and I picked it up from Harjot, that uh, prepare a good brace for them and they forget everything. Uh, they do have some problems of casting, like itching which you can manage as the way we would like to do. Uh, but they are able to even drive a car. They are doing most of their job after three months, uh, three weeks. And the callus is tremendous. Um, refactures are not there. Infections are not there. So there are tremendous advantages. So I, I don't say that humerus uh, can't be treated operatively. They are wonderful cases of surgeries uh, and surgical results. 
but it is one of the methods of management. How, how do you convince them for a conservative treatment? For me, I explain them the pros and cons and they come with the set idea that I'm no, choosing the surgeon. I, 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 the I, modality I, of treatment. <laughs> I, I tell you, if you treat one humerus conservatively... No, I have treated about three or four patients in last two years. But okay. there were strong reasons. One was a CKD. One was a 18-year-old child with a cyst there, which I knew that is going to heal. People telling him biopsy chahiye, cancer ho sakta hai. So there were reasons. But otherwise, they come with a set mind, which Sangeet is saying. Na, they yeah, yeah. come prepared. They, they are coming for surgery, like Harjot. Coming for surgery... And just choosing the surgeon, ki tum kar do. <laughs> I, I do agree that, uh, see, ultimately, counseling is an art which all of us have. Probably we are not making enough honest effort to convince them. <laughs> what I do uh, is, we may have... so what I do is, very practical, simple thing is, apply a good use lab or a reductional plaster, give, give them a comfort and ask them to come after seven days for surgery or uh, check x-ray and uh, their first reaction is sir abhi koi taklif nahi hai hume. we are all fine comfortable and take a check x-ray explain them before the check x-ray that this is what you are going to see uh, the images of previous patient etc a chart i give them that the bone ends may look bit different but you would have no problem once it heals it should be fine less than 10 percent chance it would not heal and, and they agree to it. And then they say, sir, we are comfortable. In. We have no problem. And uh, next three weeks, uh, check x-ray. Check x-ray at six weeks. And I tell you, I, I'll present a series of cases this month. And all of them have thrown a very good callus. Again, I'm not convincing. It is one of the methods. So it is one of the possibilities. In Indore, you had shown that video. Next class, you show that. Yeah, uh, well, answer well, I, yeah, yeah. You opened that video in Indo. I know. I, I, I'll show. Sir, I take your permission. I yeah, to... We all have to leave. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Good night, sir. Thank you.